Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Geller. I'm the chairman of the Pelham School Board. I'd like to introduce one of my, the other members, David Wilkinson, Candace Rapisi, Debbie Ryan, and, OK, Megan Larson is somewhere to be found. OK, so thank you for coming. Uh, we're very pleased to see uh, quite a few people here. We decided to do a form to try to give you the opportunity, first, to hear about some of the things that we're doing, and second, to ask questions and be, uh, become more informed about what's going on, and maybe ask any questions about those things that are of concern to you that you might want an answer to. During the meetings, they're very formal. It's very difficult for us to be able to do that. But so that's why we opened up a forum setting. What we're going to do is start tonight with uh, a couple of issues, which one of them is the teacher retention and recruitment issue. And the other one is going to be the PMS facilities issue. That's one of the reasons why we came to this room in this building to try to demonstrate a little bit of our concerns. So I'm going to turn it over to Candace to start the first part of our presentation. Um, we'll ask that if you can, if you have any questions, please hold them to the end of the presentation. Then we'll try to answer the questions you have, and then we'll move on to the next presentation afterwards. After that, we'll try to open it up to any other questions that might be of concern to you that you would like to bring up at this forum. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Candace. Thank you all for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Um, so as we mentioned, the first part of the talk is going to be on teacher retention and recruitment. So you may, Tom alluded to a little bit of it. Why are we having? Oh, there you go. Better. Okay. Um, so why are we having? The intent was to make sure that we tried to have a community forum. Where, thank you, <laughs> um, a community forum where we could talk about uh, issues that may be of interest to all of you. And so you may be asking, well, why did we select the topics we selected this evening? We'll go to the next one. How about if I switch sides? Is that better? No, next one. All right, I'm not in a good spot anywhere. Yeah, that better? That's better. Okay, good. All right, so this is our Pelham vision. Um, as you can see, it's a Pelham school district in collaboration with the community that we serve is committed to providing a high quality contemporary education in a safe and inclusive environment. And we want to prepare and inspire all students to achieve their full potential as long learners, critical thinkers, and contributing to citizens to society. And so as part of that vision, we always look at what are the key critical components that we need to advance that. And the key things are our facilities, we need our staff, and we need to make sure we're looking at educational curriculum for our students. So part of the reason why we selected tonight's topics is because we've done a lot of things over the past several years to advance our school district, looking at the renovation to the high school, technology integration, continuing to support arts and music, um, as well as now we want to look at our staff retention and recruitment and the PMS facility. As you know, we have an upcoming negotiation this year in the fall for our teacher negotiations, and we wanted to hear from the teachers about what's most important to them before we go into the, those negotiations this fall. And then the other piece is the middle school. This school hasn't been renovated in a very long time, and so we wanted to look at the facilities to see what are the differences that we need to make here in order to have the best um, possible school district. And Deb will talk about that a little bit later. So what are some of the objectives for this evening? We want to drive awareness around those two particular topics with teacher retention, as well as the school facilities. We want to make sure that we're sharing some of our initial findings. So what we did in terms of um, trying to get a better understanding of what teachers are looking for is we took a three-prong approach. The first is a survey that went out to everybody a couple weeks ago. We did for the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school. We asked 17 questions, which I'll go through this evening, and I'll share with you what those responses were. The second part was looking at exit interviews. We've had several teachers leave over the last year, and we wanted to know why. Is there a trend in terms of what's occurring about why teachers are leaving? Does, does one particular topic rise to the top? And then the third piece is looking at salary comparison. We want to know where Pelham School District ranks in terms of our neighboring towns in the state of New Hampshire and where we are in terms of our average salaries, which Tom will share a little bit later in the presentation. 
And then we'll, we want to hear feedback from you and insights from you. This is not meant to be a complete didactic presentation. Yes, we wanted to do some preliminary findings that have some data points to work from, but we really want to hear from all of you. We don't have all the answers. We're just starting the process, um, and we're not going to walk away here tonight with having all the answers, but rather we want to share some of the insights that we found and hear from all of you and make sure we're getting your share of voice. And then talk a little bit about what next steps we'll, we'll do moving forward. So the survey I mentioned that we sent out, we've had 106 respondents, which is great. We appreciate everyone that took the time to fill out the survey. And I'll walk you through the questions and what some of the feedback was on that. So the first two questions that we asked were simply, which school do you represent? And please select your subject area. So you may be asking, why do we want to know what school you're in? We got a lot of feedback from people about, um, you know, why do you need to know what school we're in? And what we're trying to ascertain is, is there a district-wide opportunity or area for growth? Um, is it one or two schools where we have an opportunity or area for growth? And what are those things? So it was easier to ask where everybody was located and what subject area there may be um, may concerns or opportunities that we could work through. The third question was, what is the highest degree that you've achieved? And as you can see, the majority of our teaching staff, 67%, has a master's degree or higher. Um, the other is 31.1% have a bachelor's degree and 2% have their doctorate. So part of this is meant to be informative um, so that you know what, what kind of quality teaching we have in the school. And the other is, is to make sure that, you know, we see we have a lot of teachers that have a master's degree, which, which tends to have a higher um, salary range associated with that. And we want to make sure that we're, we're looking at that from a comparator when we took at the neighboring towns. The fourth and fifth question, how many total years have you been employed as an educator? Um, as you can see, we looked at 20 plus years, 15 to 19 years, 9 to 14 years, 5 to 8 years, 2 to 4, and then if you're new to the district, if you're new to teaching. Um, the 20 plus years, we have over 20.8% of our teachers that have 20 plus years teaching experience. So that's fantastic. We have another um, 15 to 19 years, 17% of our teachers. 9 to 14 years, 26.4% of our teachers. 5 to 8 years is 17.9%. 2 to 4 years is 12.3%. And our first year teachers are around 5.7%. The second question was, how many years have you actually been employed within our current school district? And if you look at the graph on the right, you'll see that uh, 20 plus years, we have 13.2% of our teachers that have been with us for 20 years. 16% of our teachers have been with us for two, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 15 to 19 years, 15.1%, 9, 9 to 14 years is 22.6%, 5 to 8 years, we have teachers that have been with us for 21.7%, and then 2 to 4 years, we have about 16% of our teachers, and first year teachers are 13.2%. So am I satisfied working in my current school? Um, this is a little concerning. The first part of it, you see 16% strongly agree that they're satisfied, 38.7% said they agree, so a little over 50% agree. The other part is 20.8% is neutral, but 21.7% of our teachers um, said that they are disagree with being satisfied in their school. And 2.8% said they strongly disagree being satisfied in our school. So we want to figure out why that is and do a better job moving forward. And there were a lot of reasons that came in, um, individual reasons, but none that resonated to a high trend, um, except, uh, and I'll go into what it is on, on this slide here. So if you look here, the question was, which aspects of your work environment most affect your, your willingness to keep teaching at your school? The way it's asked is a little bit confusing. So if you ranked number seven, that's why you would want to stay in your school. If the answer was number one, which is on the low end, it's why you would least likely want to stay in your school. So as you can see here, the top two reasons of why people would stay in their school on the right is collaboration. And then the second one was professional growth opportunities with the purple bar. The reason teachers would least likely want to stay in their school, compensation was the number one answer. The second answer was um, around instructional resources. Uh, wait, no, that's not right. The second one is around workload, apologies. So it's workload and compensation were the two reasons teachers would least likely want to stay in school, which tells me you feel you're underpaid, obviously, and you feel your workload is way too much. Pretty obvious, right? So we want to look into those things and see how can we do a better job of that moving forward. And we'd love to hear your insights and feedback at the end of the presentation, because as I mentioned in the beginning, we don't have all the answers, but we want to hear from you because your share of voice is most important. Next question was, have I seriously considered leaving my position as a teacher? If you look at the numbers, 26.4%, the blue bar, is strongly agree. 32.1% is agree. 
That's over 50% of our staff looking that they may potentially want to leave their teaching profession. If you look at the neutral numbers, 17.9%, green number disagree, 10.4%, and strongly disagree, 132 Only 23% of our teachers feel that they wouldn't want to leave their teaching position out of 106 respondents. That's eye-opening. The next slide is, fellow teachers, trainers, facilitators, and or consultants are available to help us implement new instructional practice at our school. We've had a lot of initiatives over the last several years. As you can see by the responses, strongly agree. 11.3% feel that they do have the support that they need. 41.5% feel like they do have the support that they need. So if you look at those that are in agree, a little over 50%, almost 60% believe they have the support they need. However, neutrals around 25.5%, 17% disagree, and then strongly disagree is 0.9%. So we have some work to do there. We know, we've heard feedback, some of the individual comments were that we've had a lot of initiatives. We want to perfect those initiatives, but we need the time to be able to do it, and we need the support to be able to do it. And we know that that's a work in progress, and, it can, and we continue to work towards that, but we want to continue to get better at it. We don't just want to rest on our laurels. So one, thank you for everything that you do. Um, two, thank you for taking on these new initiatives because it is what's in the best interest of students. Um, but we also recognize that it takes time to implement those things and that you are bearing the brunt of that. Sorry. Oh, sorry, another slide. So we receive support implementing new skills until they become a natural daily practice. Um, strongly agree. It didn't populate, so let me just make sure I have it right. That's 0.9%. When you look at the agree, 19.8%. 28.3% are neutral, 35.8% disagree, and 13.2% strongly disagree. So again, over 50% of the staff doesn't feel like they have enough time to implement new changes. Thank you. We receive feedback from our colleagues about classroom practice. Strongly agree is 0.9%, agree is 45.3%, neutral 32.1%, disagree 14.2%, and strongly disagree 7.5%. So in this area, it seems like most people feel like they are getting feedback or neutral in terms of your peer collaboration. Do you feel empowered to do your job? Strongly agree is 11.3%. Agree is 41.5%. So we're about the 60% mark again. Neutral, 23.6%. Disagree, 13.2%. Strongly disagree, 10.4%. There is a positive morale among staff. Strongly agree, 0.9%. Agree, 22.6%. Neutral, 26.4%. Disagree, 27.4%. Strongly disagree, 20.8%. So more than 47% feel there's not a strong morale, and a little over 50, a little um, close to 60% feel there is strong morale. So we're split. The staff as a whole works effectively as a team, and relationships generally are strong. The strongly agree is 6.6%. Um, Agree is six, uh, sorry, strongly agree is 6.6%, agree is 38.7%, neutral is 27.4%, disagree is 21.7%, and strongly disagree with 6.6%. This question we wanted to better understand, are there work processes that are getting in your way of being able to do your day-to-day -day job? So we looked at, are there too many bureaucratic implement, impediments, paperwork, interruptions, unnecessary meetings in the school? Always, 19.8% of the staff felt that there was too many bureaucratic impediments. Frequently, 33%. Sometimes, 38.7%. Seldom, 7.5%. And never was 0.9%. The school receives adequate resources to achieve its educational mission. When you look at always, 8.5%. Frequently, over 50%. Sometimes, 36.8%. Seldom was 1.9%. And never is 2.8%. So the last question, we've heard throughout the presentation clearly compensation is important and I don't want to minimize that. But I also want to know what else is motivating to the staff that we can be doing on a regular basis. And so we asked this question about beyond, beyond financial compensation, what is it that people are looking for in order to be recognized for your efforts? And these are some of the things that came to the top. Simple thank you notes, either written or verbal. Um, the key element here is that they want it to be specific though, not just, hey, you're doing a great job. What am I doing a great job at? Be specific when you're complimenting me about something. Highlight what I'm working on or the effort that I'm putting in. Appreciation. Um, Jeans Day. I know Mr. Adamakis does that over at the elementary school and it seems to be a hit. 
um, staff meals. People mentioned Pelham School District gear. Um, there were things like just having your voice heard and being respected. People want to know that um, a lot of comments came in that you are subject matter experts in your area and you want your share of voice to be heard when decisions are being made throughout the school. Some feel that they are, some feel that they aren't. So how do we do a better job at that? Administrative and district recognition and then years of service awards. I'd love for people to give additional feedback on this when we close out the presentation because I think there's a lot that we can be doing by way of, yes, compensation, but also by way of just recognizing each other every day for the work and effort that we put in and what's most meaningful to all of you. So with that, I will turn it over to Tom, who's going to go into the exit interviews um, and why we did those and then move on to uh, some of the salary comp comparisons. Okay, this is the first year we're really trying to get some information about exit interviews. Why people are deciding to leave our, our district, and what, what the reasons are, and whether we can learn anything from those reasons to help us in the future. Um, so we took a look at the exit interviews for teachers, not for the whole staff, but for teachers. And so far that we know of, we have 41 teachers out of about 157 that are, that are leaving, about 26, well, we're actually looking at 26%. Um, top reasons, retirement, family relocation, and financial reasons. There are other reasons that, that happen, but otherwise we're looking at that. This is just this year. It hasn't been the same way in all year. I think we've been feeling that this has been growing, and that's one of the reasons why we're bringing this concern to, to you and why we're bringing it up uh, on the board. A couple of things to compare with. We're, we're trying to look at you know, how are we different from any other district or how are we similar to them. We took a look. Uh, there is no statewide data for... Um, turnover. Uh, we did ask. We found out that DOE's work, the Department of Education, might bring this into effect in next year or two, but they don't have that information now. So we tried to look around for different institutes and organizations that take that information. We found one of them that says uh, an article written last year saying the average teacher turnover in New Hampshire is under 10 percent. We are if we are corrected this year, it's going to be 26%. That's significant. At 26%, that's the same thing as saying we're replacing a full staff every four years. Now, obviously, there are people who are staying longer, but we still have that number of people, 150 plus, who are turning over every four years. That's a concern. We look at this and say, listen, the, the talent, the expertise, the uh, experience that people are bringing into the district and then f building in the district, it's being lost to us, and we have to rebuild that every four years. It's very important that we focus on this, and we try to get that number down. I took a quick look before, you know, as we're working on this, and there are approximately 16 teachers that are eligible for retirement in our district. Being eligible for retirement means that they've worked 20 years or more as, as a teacher, at least 15 of which in our district. Uh, we have about 12 more in the next three years. Now, the 16 include some teachers who are leaving this year. So with coming next year, it's not going to be quite as bad, but it is, it is a number that's been growing. Now, the district is committed to accepting three retirements per year at a minimum based on the contract. In the last couple of years, we've, had, we've tried to come up with other ways to accept a few more in those years because we, it, for us, rather than having a backlog and rather than having teachers who are eligible for retirement who cannot retire for a number of years, we're trying to uh, leave that, uh, relieve that backlog. So we've done that in the last few years, but this is what we're facing. While we're accepting these retirements, we also have to find new people and bring them into the system. It takes a certain amount of effort. A couple of years ago when we were doing the last uh, contract, I did ask what are the effects of bringing a new teacher into the district. For a brand new teacher coming into the district, we average about $7,000 over a two-year period to get them up and, and running into the district. That's extra training, mentoring, and, and other support for a new teacher. I don't know quite what it is right this year, but a couple of years ago, that's what, the, that's what the amount was. So we are looking at, at an issue that's not going to get better over time unless we start focusing on it. That's what we're doing today, and that's what we're hoping to inform you about as to these are some of the concerns that we're having coming moving to the future switch to the next. So we did an unofficial survey. I looked up all the CBAs for six neighboring districts to Pelham. Wyndham, 
Nashua, Hudson, Salem, Derry, and Londonderry. Not all the schools have the same type of uh, step schedule for teachers. But what I try to do is compare with our step schedule. We have a step schedule that guarantees a certain pay based on the amount of e education that teachers have, as well as the number of years of experience in, in public education. If a teacher comes from another district, they can qualify to have some additional steps, but this is basically what we're looking at. So when I say B1, we're talking about a bachelor's with one degree with in the first year of experience. B6 is after six years of experience. B13 is 13 years if they have a bachelor's degree. We also have a track that's for masters, and we also have a track that's for PhDs or double masters. Now what we're looking at on this number over here, this is what Pelham pays right now based on those, on those tracks. This is the average compared to Pelham of, the, of these six districts. So in other words, if somebody starts off with a bachelor at the beginning of their, of their career, we are actually competitive. We're 2% over the average. However, by year six, we're 9% below the average of those same districts. In other words, their salaries are going up significantly more than ours. By the 13th year, we're 18% below that. Okay, that's this year. When you look at masters, we're competitive in the first year. Six year, we're minus 12%. 13th year, we're minus 30%. These are concerning. We have to look at that. We have a contract that's going to continue to next year, and there's going to be negotiations in the fall for the following contract after that if it's approved by the voters. So we're comparing where we are next year when, we, when, the, contract, when the current contract ends. Still, we're doing pretty well in Pelham in the first year. However, it's fairly comparative, and we, we, we increase a little bit because the other contracts actually had fixed salaries in some of the, on some of the steps. So from one year to the next, the salary didn't change. But we do change. We went up $1,500 per, per year for each teacher. So that's why it's a little bit better. Granted, we're not Massachusetts. We're in New Hampshire. But we do have neighbors, and I was able to get information from Tingsboro and Methuen. They're right next to us. People who come to our district could easily go to that district. Those are the numbers we're comparing with. We're 15% below on the first year of our bachelors. The worst one? Take a look at these guys. If you spend, if you take a career in Pelham, you're going to be in, you, compared to the other districts, where it's going to be fairly low. It's something we have to address. Okay. The first step, though, is we're trying to get the data. We're trying to get the information to understand what the what the uh, the situation is about. We can't just say, okay, just pay more. It's going to do it. We have to take a look at a process that takes some time, takes some effort, and takes some planning. Because we could say, oh, we're going to increase this now, but the other districts may come up with new contracts in the, in the following years, and then we're still going to be behind the eight ball. So we do have to look at that. Next one. Okay. One of the reasons we're bringing this up now is that the contract that the teachers currently have has one more year. That's next year. So the process is we start negotiations later this year We've already been asked by PEA to engage in negotiations. We start the negotiation process in the summer and the fall of this year. PEA, Pelham Educational Association, they submit a request to us asking to negotiate for the next contract. They've already done this. Uh, we've asked to hold off until we have the new superintendent coming in so we can have a full team to do the negotiations. The district team, which is superintendent, a couple of board members, and some other SAU staff, the school's administrative unit staff, are, are, are on our side of the table, and the PEA representatives on the other side of the table. We enter into negotiations, bringing each of our priorities to the table. One thing to remember is that the current contract starts is the starting point for the next contract. You do not start from scratch on a new contract. Those things that have been agreed to in, a con in, a, in an existing contract is the, is the basis for the following one. What we do is we ask, each side will ask for modifications or changes. And we try to direct it in the, way, in the direction that each of our group's priorities are. It is not something where we can just say, we want to make this contract or we want to take something away. We have to, if, we, if there is something to be taken away, it has to be negotiated. In other words, we give you this if you give us that.
if all issues are agreed to, have been resolved, we sign a tentative agreement. In other words, all the issues on, on the union side, all the issues on the district side, we've found some sort of middle ground and we've actually said, okay, we're willing to agree with that. That becomes a tentative agreement. The tentative agreement then goes to the uh, union membership for ratification. In other words, they vote to support this contract or not. Once that happens, it comes to the school board and the school board votes if it, if it supports it. It does get uh, reviewed by the, by the budget committee who will give a recommendation, positive or negative, and then it goes to the voters. And the, voter, the voters do not decide what happens in the contract. The voters decide on the amount of the contract, the costs. So the costs are built into this. There are many other things that we negotiate, but it's the cost that the voters decide on. So if the voters do not decide to approve that contract, there's no contract the following year, and all the conditions that, that teachers are currently working on will be the same conditions that they work on in that, during that period until a new contract is negotiated. Okay. If the voters approve in March, if there's a if there's a tentative agreement, and it gets presented to the voters in March, then I'll take then I'll take effect in, in next year, July 9, 2019. Next. Okay. So that's some of the information that we have right now. Um, some of our thoughts moving forward, because we're giving information to you, we want to make sure that we share with you where we're, what we're thinking right now, some of the information that we have right now, and where our process is gonna go. One of the things that's important is that we develop a multi-year plan with measurable objectives. Salaries is just one issue, but the, the main priority is delivering quality education to the students and having them learn. Everything else goes to support that. We support the mission, the vision statement. Everything else is how, we, how do we do that? How do we make that happen? So part of the thing is developing not just a one-year plan, but looking at multi-year and having objectives that we can actually measure and communicate to you. This is where we are. This is where we're going. This is how well we've done or how poorly we've done. We are working on developing and improving data collection to guide those objectives. As I said, we haven't in the past taken exit interviews. We're trying to keep track of those things now. We're trying to keep track of much more information that will help guide how we will uh, move forward. Uh, it's not just about salary. There's many other things. That's part of the survey. We had a survey so we could understand those things beyond the financial compensation as well as the financial compensation. We identify strengths and opportunities for improvement. Some things on there, for example, one of them, the one with the resources, that was significant positive. So in other words, we are providing resources. We are getting to that point. We, we, it's not one of those issues, at least in the grand scale, that we're not providing the resources for them. So there's other areas we have to take a look for and, and develop um, plans to address. We have to, in part of that plan, uh, well, basically what I've already talked about, but basically we have to have reforms. What are some of the areas we have to look at? We look at it because, remember, the purpose isn't necessarily that we pay our teachers more. Our purpose is to educate students. But in order to do that, we have to do very well by the teachers to support that, that objective. So curriculum review and development, making sure the curriculum is appropriate and developed and reviewed on a regular basis. Budget and finance. End of the day, it does take dollars to run a school. We need to make sure that the dollars are appropriated, understood why it's spent, and then making sure that it's spent appropriately and uh, efficiently. It does cost money to run a school, but the better we do with the dollars, the more we can do with, with that. Administrative initiatives and accountability. It's not all on the teachers, it's on the whole team. And that includes the, the administration, that includes the leadership saying, okay, do we have initiatives that try to foster a positive uh, culture and a positive environment? Do we also have accountability that ensures that where we have weaknesses, that we have accountability and we try to address them, understand them and address them. Um, employee recruitment, retention, compensation and development initiatives is basically what we've been talking about now. How do we work on, you know, we have a CBA negotiation that's coming up. What are our priorities there? What should we do? Where should we go? How should we try to develop things? And a school board is responsible for policy. 
we have to look, we, um, that is our, one of our prime responsibilities. We don't manage the schools, we develop policy, we develop budgets, we recruit superintendents and, and oversee superintendents. Um, we have to look at those things and see if there's anything that we can do that supports it, or certainly if there are any policies that detract from, from that objective. We do have to work at that, and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna take a, a close look at that as well. So, that's the presentation for the first part of the night. We're ready for questions. <laughs> Yes. So you mentioned that uh, 41 uh, teachers were leaving this year. Does that include those that have not been asked back, or is that just people who were voluntarily departing? Candace, what's that? That is uh, voluntary, resigna voluntary resignations. Um, I did not look at the total number of folks leaving. I just looked at the teachers that were voluntarily resigning to get a better handle on why. Can you hear her? Oh, sorry. I just looked at the teachers that were actually doing voluntary resignation to get a better understanding of why, so we could feed into this piece, not the total number. Any other questions? Yes, Sue. So, I was looking at the survey and I was looking at um, numbers 13, 14, which I think was about the school climate, and I was wondering if you looked at that with a building breakdown. Uh, what did the high school look like? What, what did the middle school, what did the elementary look like? You mean this? It might be better to look at it for a building. Yeah, no, it's a fair question, and we will synthesize this even more. This was just kind of a first blush at the information, but yes, based on the fact that we asked what buildings were, we can dig a little bit deeper into this. Yes. Is it possible that the members here could get a copy of this presentation for later review and digestion? I was planning to have it put on the website, so it's available to you as a PDF form. Yes. Uh, so I'm curious why these issues haven't been addressed previously. There must be some type of barrier in terms of why the salaries are so drastically different. So I'm curious what the number one barrier is to like negotiating that. Well, well, the voters has a, have a lot to do with it, but you have to look at the climate of the, in the, prior to this last contract, we were in a, a really poor economy, and um, there's an unsaid mandate about um, percentage increases, and so we were cognizant of needing to stay below a certain, like 2%, 3%, because we didn't feel that it would be palatable to the voters at the time, because in the regular economy, the voters were getting no raises, losing jobs. Um, some, some people in their um, fields were actually taking pay cuts. So, and I, I do realize 3% of 40,000 is um, a lot smaller than 3% of 150,000, but it's that perception versus reality. Like, I'm only getting 2% or I took a pay cut and you want us to approve 5%, right? So it, that, that was a big part of it in the last couple of contracts. Um, I was part of the negotiation of the last two contracts. They were obviously both successful. We're in this one now and one before that. Before that, um, there was a tentative agreement that was not approved. There was one year the teachers did not have a contract. That's not this one, not the one before, but the one before that. The one that was not approved was about 80% higher in cost per year than the one that was approved the year later. So the voters, pretty much, I think it was like 60, 40 against, did not support a contract with the significant salary increases. So you have a year without a contract, so you really need a contract. Um, you go into negotiations and you say, listen, the important thing is to try to come up with a successful negotiation that produces a tentative agreement 
that then will be approved by the voters. So that's always, from my perspective, that's always a concern. I can be in a negotiation, the team can be in a negotiation, say we'd like to, we'd love to support that. The end of the day is if you don't get it past the voters at that thing, you go without a year, a year without a contract until the next one. So it's a balance you take at the time and the decisions. Deb was on that negotiation as well. We did, were well aware of the concerns at the time, both of the community and also the teachers. Now remember, the contract that did get approved after that one year of hiatus was ratified by a significant number of the teachers and all the school board. Okay, it was supported. They did, they did accept the, the amounts that are there. What we're looking at now is we're trying to say, this is a focus that's affecting all of us. It's affecting our teaching staff, it's affecting all of our community, it's affecting our students. We have to take some sort of action and we have an opportunity with a new contract coming in place. You really just can't say, okay, well, we have a contract now, let's just put it to the, to the voters, oh, let's just increase that. There is a process you have to go through. We have an opportunity now to take a look and try to, from our perspective, from the board perspective, it's, a, it's a, an important priority. You know, teacher retention is important. We have to look at the reasons and we have to try to address those. And one of the ways to do it is by bringing up our, our concerns in the negotiation. So with this, we have an opportunity to say, is there a direction we want to head in? Are the things that we can do, are the things that we can negotiate that will improve not only retention recruitment, but morale, culture, and delivery of education? And so we're bringing that also now, we also have to have an understanding. There has been concerns in the past, you don't hear anything about the teacher contract until one month before election day. You know, nobody's talked about us about the details or anything like that. It's very difficult and sometimes it's very dry. You have to go through a lot of details. We're trying to present to you at least some of the concerns we have before we go into negotiation so that you have an understanding what our, what our objectives are and we have a discussion as to whether these objectives are relevant, necessary, supported. You know, if you understand it, we believe that you'll have an opinion about it, whether you support it or not, but at least you have an opinion about the information that we're trying to give you of where we are, where we stand vis-a-vis -vis the other districts. Yes? Can you explain a little, um, is it, how long is the contract? Three years? That can be negotiated. This contract is three years. The one previous to that is two years, and the next one, whatever's negotiated. Can you explain a little within the contract, what's um, embedded into it, the role, is it, The contract is available on the website, the full contract. It's, if you go to the human resources and you'll see PEA and it'll have CPA agreements, you can see the whole thing. The, it goes, the system we use is, is a step schedule, uh, which means based on, the, on your degree and the years of experience, this is the level at which you will be paid. Um, there are other activities and things that you can do to augment that, like other, if you're doing sports, if you're doing clubs, if you're doing other types of things. But otherwise, based on that, it's a very strict scale. Um, we can negotiate changes in that, but otherwise, that's part of the negotiation. This current contract is $1,500. Each a teacher, for example, let's say you're at you know, bachelor's year three. In the next year, your salary will be $1,500 more than what you had in in year three. So you'll be before next year, you'll have $1,500 more than that. So neighboring towns? Neighboring towns. My personal opinion of the data that I pulled is that neighboring towns, one of the big differences is the, the scale. Because as I said, we all start off at year one and we're fairly competitive. But by the time you get to year six, you can see a, uh, a decline. By the time you get to the top of the scale, which doesn't mean that you don't get increases, but that's the top of the scale. When you're out of schedule, there's a certain amount in this contract, I believe it's $1,500. So each year, if you're past the 13 years, you would receive $1,500 more than the year that you had before. So that can be different for different people in different years because they might have come in at a different time and uh, on, a different, on a different level at the time. Yes? So on this contract, assuming that the step stays the same, which it doesn't, but like if you're staying on the same step, 
it's a dollar amount increase from year to year rather than a percentage? Yes. If you, the schedule sort of is basically a spreadsheet. You have a track on the top saying if you have a bachelor's degree in step one, two, three, four, five, six until 13, then after that is that. And each one of those has a dollar amount. But it was designed in the last contract, so it would be $1,500 more. So an individual teacher would see $1,500 more than they did the previous year. Plus maybe the difference in step. Because in the first five steps, there's a $500 difference as well. And in the uh, following steps, there's a $1,000 difference. But if you had a, a percentage increase that was across the board, your base salary by your step, those people, so when the discrepancy gets bigger, the higher steps would get bigger increases based on the percentage. Yes. So why not? Yeah, versus the set job. Versus the set job. Yeah. So the discrepancy gets huge. I know that in Lowell, mm -hmm. um, master's six years is almost twice the salary of that. It's just a little bit less than twice the salary for master's six years. So your discrepancy is growing at your years. Yes because you're doing like a set increase versus a percentage. Yes. And another thing that um, Lowell does is like it's 2% in September, 1% in December, 1% in June. So as you're rolling through the years, your salaries, I mean, you start off in September with your increase, but it's incremental and it's a multi-year contrast. Okay. That's not the way this one was negotiated, mm -hmm. but Ideas. We're looking for ideas. That is it's an idea. <laughs> Maybe you want to share your perspective. Yeah, can I just get some white? I've been uh, negotiating for a long time. Can you? Can you? Like, um, Maybe. Mm -hmm. And can you just say who Hi, I'm Sue Harden. Um, I'm currently the pr vice president of the PEA. I'm a former president. I've been um, negotiating for a long time. And what happened was and it was before the school board came on, there was a period that our starting teacher salary was extremely low, much lower than everybody else. And at that point, we felt we needed to retain, uh, to attract candidates that wanted to come to Pelham. So at the time, we made the decision, and I can't remember if it was four contracts ago or five contracts. Um, I've just been doing it for a long time. We made the decision that we needed to get those people at the bottom of the contract scale to have a competitive wage with everybody around us. So one of the things we did was we, sh we shrank the salary schedule and we put the money into the bottom so that now it used to be your steps were your, your years of service. Now we contracted some of those steps so that, um, for instance, I could have 13 years of service but maybe I might only be on step number 11 because at some point we contracted the steps. So we really made that decision that we had to attract the younger candidates to, the, to, the, um, to our district, but at the same time, we didn't see what ended up happening to the top of the contract scale. Now that I'm kind of getting near that top of the contract scale, I completely understand it. But um, so we, it's always been, you know, it's always been a little bit different in Pelham. We're trying to do um, negotiations always to correct problems, and I think that we need to do more forward thinking, which is what I think the board wants to do now. That's part of the discussion. We want to have both sides. When you enter into negotiations, we don't have that freedom to discuss these things. These things are confidential negotiated by the two, and we're obliged not to talk about it, okay? We are maintaining the integrity of the union. We maintain, maintain the integrity of the, of the district not to do that. What comes out of negotiation at the end, a tentative agreement, is what you see. How we get there, we can't share. We can't talk about it. But we do have objectives when we go in there, and we do have, and I would say both sides have objectives to do the best by the, for the students. Okay, we have a different type of issue, but we did have two approved contracts. But now our issue, we're looking at the outside world, and we're looking at the market, and we're saying, okay, we have a market there, we have high turnover, we have to make sure that we can do, deliver quality education, and this is part of it. Do you have a tuition reimbursement um, program if the teachers want to continue their ed? Yes, we do. I believe we have a pool of money 
if that's correct, I believe we have a pool of money, so it's subject to that availability being, being in there. Okay, the question is whether there are tuition reimbursement plan. And there is a tuition reimbursement plan, teachers can apply for it, but there is a pool of money each year. We have to budget a certain amount. So it's not per employee? There's no stipend per employee? No. To be able to it's a pool. Yes, in the back. Um, Chris, a lot of talks about the, um, the salaries. Is the school board addressing um, things like morale, um, the teachers that feel that they're overworked, a lot of that came out. With the conversation focused on money, has the board been discussing what they can do about if we feel the workload is too hard or, or too much, the time involved? Has that been brought up? Do you want to answer? Okay. Yes, it has. Uh, <laughs> um, well, perhaps you want. I have my own personal opinions, but maybe this. What's the matter? You don't like when I dress up as a cheerleader? <laughs> um, that's a hidden. Uh, I dressed up as a cheerleader for the staff um, breakfast. Um, I thought that was morale enough. Um, no, I realize it's not. Um, so this is something that is discussed a lot, and I think we did recognize. Um, when we brought in an interim superintendent that, I guess it's like a history thing, right? So we, we, we became our own SAU and um, Amanda Lacrose became the superintendent and she was all gung-ho and like, make this better, change this, do this. And then we realized, oh, oh my goodness, we're going way too fast. And when um, we brought in an interim superintendent. We felt that that was a perfect opportunity to go, er, put the brakes on. We really, Betsy, this is what we'd like to see accomplished, but let's not add any new initiatives and, and slow things down. And I guess some of the um, thing is, is it, you always want to be better. Like we had this goal to be the best district in the state. And I think we got excited and it was like, do, 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 right? Then we've had some turnover all right, administratively. And that is a huge factor. When you have assistant principals and principals and those things change, those things affect morale. So you get somebody that comes in, they start to get the ball rolling, then for whatever reason things happen, then that person leaves and then you gotta start back over again and build, those, build that camaraderie and that culture in your individual buildings. So we're faced with that factor as well. And, and, and that is, we're hoping that we can get that solidified and we can things can be more consistent and we don't have that turnover administratively um, you know and we are trying as many things you know each of the building principals have all tried some different things on their own um, we are cognizant of it and it is something that's extremely important to us and with our new superintendent starting and he's going to be here for 20 years. I don't know if he's here, but he doesn't know that yet. And if it's, if it's working out good, if it's working out well, he's going to stay for a while. We'll have some consistency, and we'll be able to start building that momentum again. So my personal opinion. <laughs> um, if salaries aren't appropriate, they can detract. But salary is not the only factor that delivers quality education. Can you hear it now? Okay. Uh, salary is not the only factor. Appreciation, professional development, respect, courtesy, resources, support, those are all part of it. We, we can talk a little about those things, maybe in another form if that's something that's interesting to you, but we're trying to focus on some of the things based on the timing right now, and one of the things is that contract. We do have to look at it. We, I, I think I speak for the board that we recognize that there's concern that we have to work toward that. If you do not know it, our interim superintendent is sitting right over here, Betsy Cox. We greatly appreciate the work that she has done coming in, taking over on short notice, and keeping us on an even keel and also doing a lot of improvements. She hasn't been late. We, we did not ask her to say, I just want to be a caretaker for the year. We do recognize that you can't do initiatives in one year and therefore all of a sudden you just put that in place.
But we did try to say, okay, those things that we can focus on, those things that we have concerns about, we've asked her to address, and we believe that she's addressed quite a few of them. We'll be very sorry to see her go. <laughs> Bill Furbush is the assistant superintendent in Exeter, I believe. He's coming on July 1st. He's already been here, I don't know, half a dozen to a dozen times. He's been coming in for interviews, I believe, not of his, but of uh, support uh, other staff that's coming in for, for next year. He's been coming in to be apprised of where we stand, where, what our plans are, what our initiatives are, and so that when he comes in on July 1st, he will not be sitting there from day one saying, I don't know what's going on. He has some input as to who is coming in, the new teachers. He has some understanding of who administrators are, and I believe he's probably met a, a number of teachers as well. He's very enthusiastic about it, and we're very hopeful that it's going to provide some success. Um, my personal thought, I think it's probably what's going to happen, is we're going to give him July to get settled, and August, the school board and him will be talking about objectives, his objectives. Basically, that's where it is. He's our employee. We go. We have to work through him, and he institutes, and or the superintendent in any case, and they institute the, the procedures and operations. It's not the board's role to do to be doing that. But we want to make sure that from day from first month, that he has an understanding of where our priorities are as a board, and we are trying to develop those priorities by sharing them to you with you and getting your feedback on those. Okay, I'm gonna take a couple more questions and then we're gonna turn it over to the next segment. So we have an opportunity for that. A comment. Um, so part of the teacher members or the teacher contracts is getting the voters to approve yes. the contracts. The voters don't know the teachers. And we don't have a lot of opportunities to interact with them. And I think it would be really nice if each school highlighted a teacher maybe every week or every month so we could know who these are. My son has been in the school for two years and I don't know the teachers. I couldn't tell you who he would have an opportunity to have next year. I don't know any of the specialists. We just don't know these things because it's hard to find. I can look it up on the website but it doesn't tell me. Same thing. Do you want to answer that? Or add a comment? Because we, we have been talking about this. So. That's a great idea, and that's exactly one of the things we'd like to do, is how do we spotlight our teachers that are doing great work that we don't hear about every day, um, or that are working towards a district initiative? You know, we have personalized learning as a, as a district initiative. Who's doing that in an innovative way, or sharing their learnings with other teachers and bringing other teachers along? And how can we do that? And that's part of the feedback we want to hear from you. Is, as I said at the beginning, we don't have all the ideas. We, we're thinking of things. You know, one of the things I thought about is we're revamping our website. And is there a way to do some of the thing where on the website where all of you could be recognizing peers, whether it's, you know, somebody helped me out with something, or we're spotlighting a teacher who's done a great job, or, um, you know, somebody worked with a student and that student has seen significant achievement. Whatever it might be, is it collaboration? Is it, you know, um, coaching and feedback? Whatever the categories are, and I don't know what that looks like yet, but we do that in the outside business world, and I think it's really helpful when you're recognizing people that you're working with. It helps to build morale. It helps let people know they're appreciated, and it's, it could be a scrolling thing on the website that, to your point, Everybody can see what our teachers are doing, including our community members that we want to get their engagement about what's going on in the schools that may not have students in the schools. So any ideas that you have, please send them to us because we want to hear your feedback. That's not just talk. We really want to know what's meaningful to you and what we can be doing differently. Are we going to be able to institute everything? Maybe not, but any idea is a good idea and it's a starting platform. So thank you. There was one other person I think had their hand up. If not. I know this was supposed to be a year with no new initiatives and whatnot. Um, at my school, um, you know, we had math pilot. We have a brand new reading program. There's new science curriculum. Um, there is the um, personalized learning. We also have um, social and emotional. So to say that we don't have any new initiatives is a difficult thing to say because we're pretty much overwhelmed with all the new and wonderful things that we have. And we love getting those changes because it makes our school better. But that's where we're struggling to figure out how do we get better as teachers if we don't even have a second to dig through and say, okay, we did wonders for the first time for a full year with everybody. Where are we at? 
okay, this isn't, we don't want to do the stand, standard test that's there. We need to create something or whatever to make it better for the students, but there's, we're running out of time. I mean. I hear what you're saying. We've heard it on the survey as well. We've also heard it in person as well. Um, when I say new initiatives, these are things that were already in the works, I believe, and might have been put into effect this year. I don't know that there are any initiatives that were introduced this year. These are things that may have already been in effect or introduced at the beginning of the year. That was something that was already discussed before, and it's just not something we can stop with the new superintendent coming in. I don't believe there are new ones beyond that. I believe that we tried to keep that down, tried to improve on the things that are already in the works, and go from there. I recognize what you're saying. I'm not saying anything about that, but we did not, we made a conscious decision not to do new initiatives, but try to work on the issue, on the concerns and, and challenges that we have this year. So I'm, one last question. Sorry to belabor this, but I do look forward to the next piece, but uh, Deb, Megan, Candace, David, Tom, thank you very much. I do think the leadership that you continue to show and the stability of the school board that helps all of the problems. How we got here, we got here. How we get going forward is more sessions like this. And this is great. I mean, this is small town, New Hampshire, if you will. Uh, how it works is to have more communication. I worry a great deal about the fact that there aren't some people in this room that need to know more. So I think more opportunities like this, and everybody can talk to their friends and neighbors, say, hey, we got a real problem. Education is about investment in all of our future. We're doing great with a very little amount, but if we don't do more, we're going to fall behind. So what is it that we can do, both from a morale and, of course, from a dollar and cents, but that should just be part of the larger package. These are really hard issues. Uh, thank you for being open about the challenges to them. And I do have a specific question on so I can see it both ways, the benefit of, say, a one-year teacher contract or a three-year teacher contract. The benefits I see for a one-year is that it's always out there in front of the town and that, hey, we made some progress, we didn't ask too much in one year, but now we're going to keep making progress. And I can see benefits of every year that we walk in, hopefully something good, and we don't have to worry about it again. But I think this is a conversation uh, that warrants you know, uh, more, more time and more cycles as a town. And then the last thing I'll say is I deeply respect, you know, from my perspective, in a classroom, it's an entrepreneurial startup. You've got, I mean, every day you're on stage and performing and making things happen. And we, the townspeople, the, the state people, the, the nation, we continue to put rocks in your pack um, <laughs> as you go along. And we offer all kinds of great bureaucratic ideas, and they're all well-meaning. And they may be great in five years, but if we only let you do them for three, now you get a new set of rocks in your pack and you don't get all the old ones cleared up. But you have to keep going every day. I don't have an answer for that. That's true everywhere. In our 30-second society, that we, as long as a tweet and everybody loses attention, it turns, including the kids. I don't know how to fix that either. But I love what I see here. I think this is great stuff. Uh, but we we got a lot, a lot still to do. We have to more. Thank you. Mentioning that, there are a couple things mentioned, I just want to say one last thing and then I'll turn it over to the next session. If you aren't aware, we have board meetings that take place every two weeks. We're on PTV. We now share on the website all the agenda packages, all the meeting packages in full to give you an idea of what it is we're dealing with at the time and the issues that we're, that we're dealing with. That is part of the, that's part of the situation here. We do need your active participation in this. We're trying to provide more information to you, but we can't make you read it. We can't make you follow it. You do have to turn on the computer. You do have to go to the website. You do have to read some of these things. Um, I personally, I post on a, Pelham, on a Facebook page called Pelham Schools Forum. After every meeting, most every meeting, I give a little synopsis of what it is we discussed and any decisions that were made. I have a readership of maybe four, uh, about 600 people. But that's part of the thing. We do not have this centralized system that says, we're going to give you all the information that you want if you don't read it. We do have a website. We do have PTV. We do have lots of opportunities to, to be able to follow what's going on. Our board meetings are very structured. 
can't, we can't help that. We can't have discussions like we're having today. So we will, based on this, I hope that we will have more forums and we'll take a look at some, and we'd love feedback on any other issues that you'd like us to, to consider and maybe discuss in the forum. So I'm going to turn it over to, is it, Deb? Turn over to, I'll turn it over to Deb. So she's going to introduce the next section. So, so thank you, um, everybody, for coming. Are you all going to leave for my part? No. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, but, and there's cookies um, and, and water back there, too. So if anybody needs, um, and if you're not familiar with this building, um, one of the drawbacks is, is there's only one restroom, and that's in the, in the, in the presentation, and that is over here to the left. Um, so um, we formed, I'm going to let Mr. Gould, this is uh, Mr. John Gould over here. He was part of the Facilities Assessment Committee. So this past year, we spent um, a, a, a year assessing this building, gathering data, and um, to then move forward. And we've now, we've, the board has made a decision to go forward with a new building or a renovation and upgrade of this building. And we're in that process now. But this presentation will explain to you what we found, why we have issues, and um, where we're going from here. So this is uh, Mr. John Gould. Hopefully this isn't too feedbacky from over here. No, I think that's okay. Um, so as Deb said, my name is John Gould. I'm resident of the town. I have two children in the, well, one in the school system right now in the elementary school. Um, my background is I'm the director of enterprise asset management for a consulting firm in Boston. And that's not dealing with money. It's dealing with physical facilities. So uh, when the opportunity came along to participate in this um, facilities assessment group, I jumped at it. Um, this is something I do professionally, um, work with very large organizations, universities, um, doing facilities assessments, determining their asset management needs and developing planning and strategies for long-term viability. Because one of the most important things that I want people to understand is that from a town taxpayer perspective, 75% of the cost of ownership of this building is not in building it, it's in maintaining it. So when we build facilities that are not easily maintained, they cost a lot of money to operate, we have problems. So someone made a comment earlier about making an investment. I'd like to start and end with quotes. So an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. I think we can kind of all agree with that. Um, ben Frank was a pretty smart guy. Um, relative to our charge as a, um, a group, and this is a little bit of an eye chart. This presentation is also on um, the Pelham School Board website, I believe, already. Um, so we gave this presentation a few, about a month ago. Um, so in I'll just condense it because it's hot in here. Um, spring of 2017, SEU 28, they formed a subcommittee to basically go out and um, do some surveying, do some review, some walkthroughs of these spaces to determine uh, what the needs were, what the concerns were from the different stakeholders, so students, parents, faculty, staff. Um, after conducting these walkthroughs and the surveys, um, basically the, faci the facilities assessment committee determined that uh, the Pelham Memorial School is a facility in need of renovations and upgrades to carry the Pelham School District towards, forward, I'm sorry, in this new century. I think it's pretty obvious. Do we have any parents of P Pelham? Yeah, okay. So you know what we're dealing with here. If you have not walked through the school, I encourage you, provided you have the ability to, take a look. And we're gonna show some pictures here, but seeing is believing. Um, so our recommendation to back to the school board was that um, the school board vote to create and charge a Pelham Memorial School Building Committee, so two separate things. It was the assessment committee and now the actual building committee. Uh, to begin the task of putting together um, a plan to basically process these and make recommendations come to fruition. What this boils down to is it's great to talk about it. How do we make this a reality? What are our options? How do we make these improvements? What does the scale and the scope of this look like? Um, and really what this will boil down to is to uh, provide an article for a bond vote, undertake the needed work for a spring warrant article for 2020. So that is our charge. So we talked a little bit about the process. We had walkthroughs of the facilities. Uh, there were surveys done, getting feedback from all those stakeholders, their impressions, concerns. Um, all this information was reviewed, discussed, and then ultimately a report was developed 
to highlight the issues. Um, so this is kind of important too for some folks maybe that have not been around or are not aware of the kind of the facility timeline. It's kind of an important thing to understand. So this building was built in 1965, quickly was outpaced and needed an addition in 1968 to 70. Nothing happened from 1970 to 2012 of any sort of meaningful improvement. Sure, there were private projects done here and there. That's pretty significant. 42 years and nothing happening. Um, and that nothing that did end up happening was some modular classrooms were put in because there were just no more room. Um, in the last four years, though, there has been an effort to do some upgrades to HVAC, um, the office area, the nurse's office, um, the front entry um, security upgrades. Um, and then happening this summer, they're going to be adding some more modular classrooms to accommodate the band program, the music program, just to get them in their own space. So let's talk a little bit about the key findings. Um, the gymnasium in general, um, it lacks enough seating for school meetings um, for students, staff, and parents. Um, there's no place within this facility, to, this facility to have a whole school meeting. So that's impossible. Can't do it. Um, inadequate ventilation, um, lack of storage. Things are stored right up to the end lines of courts. Um, the stage area for that the band does use is, is way too small, basically making it inadequate for any sort of meaningful uh, choral or band program need. Um, and then the physical education office, you kind of see that. Let's see if I can scroll over maybe this guy right here. It's literally in like a six by eight closet, like literally. It's pretty bad. I don't like using that word. I'm sorry. It is in the six by eight closet. Not literally. Um, locker rooms. This one was scary. Um, to say that the locker room facilities are out of date is probably the understatement of the evening. Um, they are downstairs. downstairs. You can walk down and check them out. So this center one here, that's the shower room. This is not a prison, <laughs> but it does it does warm. <laughs> It does look like it. Locker, lockers in these rooms are not, they're not used. They're, they're too small, they can't, bags can't be fit in there. There's stuff on the floor. There's no benches in these places. Um, there's single stall bathrooms inside these locker rooms. Um, it's just not a really nice setup for lack of a better term. Uh, public restrooms, um, Deb brought that up. There's one restroom out here. So for all these events that happen, basketball games and weekends, all the things, there's one room, dances. They have to get escorted around the building to go to other rooms, to other restrooms. In general, storage issues, things being put in places just because there's nowhere else to put it. As you can see, those are cheer mats back here, all those chairs up against the wall. Is the fire marshal here today? No? Okay. Shh. Good. We joke, but we don't. Um, and as you can see from some of these pictures, obviously it's very difficult to see from a distance. This is on the website. We have all these pictures that you guys can take a look at. There's just no space. There's no room for stuff. Stuff's getting in the way. It's a problem. Uh, cafeteria, you guys are in it right now. So you guys probably can just say, all right, no window shades to protect from glare and heat. I've been staring at the sun for the last hour. Um, the heat produced from the cooking appliances, you don't have the benefit of that this evening, but the kitchen itself is right back there. Um, it's very warm in here. Came in during a lunch area. It was very hot. Um, and then the furnishings are a little out of date based on some of the social needs that are really necessary for today's students. And then inside the kitchen area itself, there's inadequate storage, um, proper storage for food and supplies. I don't want that to be misconstrued as that food and supplies are not being properly stored. It's just not enough. They need more. They can't do things like bulk orders to get a better price on food because there's nowhere to put it. Um, and then you can see the cheer and wrestling mats there. Classrooms. Obviously, the most important part of all this is the educational component. Um, I got to take a step back here, too, and just say, you know, Stacy, Stacy here? Hi. Yeah. Stacy walked me through. I had the benefit of coming through during the school day. She kind of took me through the whole facility. Um, I was very concerned when I left. Uh, my son's in first grade. I'm hoping that something gets done between now and then, but 
we'll see. Um, there's no band room in this building. Obviously, the modular units are being leveraged for music. But as I was here, the band was practicing on the first floor, and then the second floor, you could hear everything. And right, right above them were some of the special services rooms. <laughs> so kids that are getting speech therapy or dealing with emotional support issues, whatever it might be, the band's banging away downstairs. And there's nothing that they can do about it. There's no space. That's part of the modular reason. But um, education-wise, it's just not physically conducive to a good experience for, all, for everyone. I'm not an educator, and I could figure that out. Um, some of the other areas, so the special education classrooms directly um, above the music room. Uh, guidance areas lack the necessary privacy and configuration to support proper use. You, to go into the guidance area, you may very well be, you know, if a guidance counselor needs to talk to a parent on the phone, well, that phone's out in a common area, and they can't have a private conversation. Um, the lab classrooms are, are not sufficient for teaching needs. Um, art rooms lacking proper ventilation. When they have the kiln in use, it it's, gets up to some god-awful degree. Um, OSHA says you're supposed to go home when the temperature is 89 degrees. That's obviously not happening in this building. All right, so proposed next steps. And we kind of, some of these have already been adopted based on our recommendations. Um, the creation of a Pelham School Board sponsored PMS building subcommittee to oversee this project. And what does this really mean? It's the next steps for this are about bringing in um, professionals who focus on building design, classrooms, um, educational needs, and come up with some of these architectural drawings and design recommendations not so much based strictly on facilities, but what are the programmatic needs today and what are we forecasting the pro programmatic needs to be moving forward? And we talk a little bit, a lot, a lot about the, stu the, sa the salary issues or addressing issues with the teacher contracts for today, but especially in facilities, if we don't have enough foresight, um, we're gonna end up with another big dig, which was obsolete seven years before it was finished. So we don't wanna do that. So we need to be mindful of that. Um, and we have specif uh, we have FY19 specified budget funds to accomplish this. So we have money set aside to go out and hire people to work with this building subcommittee um, to come back to the school board with an actionable plan and options, um, ideally, to move forward with. Um, and then ultimately, our goal here really is to c have that presentation of a barn article, bond article uh, for district ballot vote in spring of 2020. And then the goal would be to complete the project within five years. So lastly, like I said, I start and end with quotes. Sooner or later, everyone sits down to a banquet of consequences. Another good one, Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, if we don't do something today, this is not going away. This is only going to get worse, and it's only going to cost more money. And we're obviously, as a taxpayer, I'm cost conscious. However, um, if we're not in a position to make the right decisions for not only the facilities themselves, but for those programmatic needs that we talked about, um, we're going to have teacher retention issues regardless of what we pay them. We're not going to be in a position to support proper education. So, Deb, if you want to comment further on this. So that was, um, a, you know, a brief synopsis. There's a lot of... Um, detail and so if people have other questions regarding or if um, staff want to pipe up on some of the difficulties that um, they're experiencing then this would be a good time too but um, open I'm gonna open for questions before because I could go on and give you the whole history of how we got here and blah 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 but maybe that will come up in the conversation anybody so you talk about the maintenance of the building. Is there any sort of um, study been done about the energy costs of what it takes to keep the building in the, in the wintertime, et cetera, et cetera? Um, it hasn't gone to that level of <coughs> part and partial of it. If you look at the... Um, the question was about energy costs, and have they been studied? So we, we do a lot of sustainability projects. We do a lot of projects in the state of California where now... They just pass a law. If you're building a new house, you have to put in a solar panel. That's the new rule. Um, so 
to do energy analysis and energy studies, um, they're kind of expensive. Um, within the context of what we're trying to accomplish here, um, it's pretty clear that the infrastructure is, is not <laughs> energy efficient. Um, so we don't want to spend good money after bad. However, in the design elements of what we do, um, things are taken into consideration like solar refraction. You know, how do we angle the building to avoid the sun angle for the right period of time to get more heat during the winter and not as much. And so there's a lot of stuff that goes into that from a uh, architectural engineering design side. I think for us, it's really marrying the programmatic needs to the physical needs and what's the right number, you know, because this does have to get voted on <laughs> by the town. So we could build a $150 million Taj Mahal out back. Be awesome if we got all, everyone got everything they wanted. Um, we need to be a little pragmatic and determine kind of what specifically that need is going to be with, you know, the goal and effort to be, you know, have a lead certification, you know, is, is, is kind of a standard these days in building, so. Yeah, we, when we did the high school, we, you know, addressed, like John said, in the design piece and when we implemented it, things, you know, I, I'm not an expert on any of this, but, you know, the right kind of windows for better energy efficiency, the right kind of HVA systems, all those kind of things were addressed at the time um, of the build of when we built it. Yeah. Yeah, but you're looking at uh, a renovation, a retrofit and renovation similar to what we did at the high school in addition. Is that where we're looking, headed towards? We're, call we're calling the committee the Renovation and Upgrade Committee. Um, that is probably where we're heading. That is probably what is palatable. Um, we also have to take in consideration. Um, spacing issues as far as building on this property. We have a decent sized property, but we don't have the ability to, um, I think, tear, build an entirely new building while this one's still existing. So it would be some type of um, similar situation to the high school. I can't guarantee that's the answer, but that is kind of where we're heading. And that's part of what that study is going to do, ultimately, is to determine, you know, what are those viable options? Because in many cases, a teardown Maybe cheaper than a renovation. We're not suggesting that it is, but we really need to understand what the options are, what's going to make the most sense programmatically, you know, today and the future, and then moving it forward. Um, something that can be voted on and get adopted. We can make it happen. So. I should give him the mic and I'll talk. <laughs> it's okay. I had a question. Other than the, the modular between the span, is there an intro plan for students that have to? Here, here, here prior to the renovation. Like, my daughter won't be here. She'll have to finish her years here the way it is. But is there a plan to better accommodate the kids that are here and have to continue their education here before this upgrade happens to make things better for them? So is there an interim plan before um, before something, a solution is voted yeah. on and approved? Right. At this juncture, no. Because other than like we did put in, we are putting in the band portable. I don't know if people will realize we have 100, about 100 students in the band this year. It um, anticipates to be larger next year. And she, they're in three different spaces now. And it's, not, and it's difficult for the band, but it's also difficult for the building. As um, uh, John said, um, the band is heard throughout the entire building, so it does affect um, um, the entire student body and teachers. No. There is not a plan on the table right now. And I'm talking about things as minimal as, like, I am completely disgusted that my daughter has to go into that locker room. Like, there's oh, not, like, oh, a plan to, like, do, like, do, like, a major clean okay. So the kids that have to go in there, like, we're going to make it as clean as possible to let the kids go in there, as gross as it is. The right. lockers still may work, or you don't have to use the showers, but we're going to try to clean up this area as best. We're going to... I thought you were talking no, about... No, 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 no. Okay. I just mean, like, little things to make it better for the kids that have to go into that locker room, or they have to eat in this cafeteria with mats and, right. you know, little things is all I was just curious about. So there has been little improvements in things over the years, right? Um, we painted the front hallway. We're trying to do some of their, their thoughts about making sure we paint the bathrooms, things like that. Um, they are old and outdated, though they are clean. Um, I just want to make sure, um, shout out to our custodians that did his clean down there, it's just old and gross. Um, <laughs> <laughs> clean but gross. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, I, just for an example, right, the high school has those same showers. You know, my, my son's a senior and he did not use the showers in that high school. 
And then, as soon as they built the new showers, he actually takes a shower after sports a lot now. <laughs> you know, because it's not like a prison, like he said. So little things like that make a huge difference. And, and uh, it's just a little thing, but it's a, it's important. Um, so those are things that we can look. Definitely, you know, we have tried to do little things over time. You know, no, we don't have space right now to move these things. Could we put them in a container outside? Yes, but then that's not feasible moving them out of the container back into the gym. You know, so and this staff and these and these administrators over the years have looked at this building ad nauseum, rearranged, moved, reconfigured, and <coughs> trying to optimize the space the best way that they can. So I, I give them credit for that. Um. My daughter came home a little concerned today because she heard that the modular for the band was not ordered yet. Okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you a scoop. Come on! <laughs> You're making me it panic. was ordered. However, there is very few companies that do this, so it has been delayed, and it's looking September, October, as a uh, part in the end of September, October, as opposed to having it ready to go for September or August 29th or whatever the first day. Get a delay. There is a delay, it is on the way. Okay. <laughs> the other concern was um, the rooms are really hot. I know it's the HVAC, it's horrible, but can we turn the heat off? I believe <laughs> it is some off. Of those um, rooms. <laughs> some, uh, some of the kids were complaining that it's really it is hot. hot. It is extremely hot in here. We, we did look at um, uh, get price quotes for um, HVAC for both the elementary and the middle school. They came in exorbitantly high, and so we asked to take a look at it again. And only from experience did we learn that. We had a price quote done at the high school, and the first price quote was through the roof. Like, it was like the most fancy system in the entire planet. And, I mean, it literally went from a couple million down to a reasonable number when we did the high school. So we knew that from experience. Wait a minute, this first quote isn't what we're, what we're going to go with. We actually have halved. The quote here was around a little over a million. We're down to 550 now. But with a building being potentially done, we have to look do we want to drop 550 into this if it's going to be changed, right? At the high school, we, were, we did do the, H, the HVAC upgrade, but we were able to retrofit that back into when we rebuilt the building so we didn't have to tear it all up and start all over again. Um, yeah, too. I think we're. we're this subcommittee has been charged already. So we, we met the other day. We're, we're under the gun here. We're, we're going. Um, part and partial to that is this assessment's going to happen pretty quickly with the engineering and architectural firms. It's not going to happen fast. It's going to start soon. Within that context, if out of those discussions, it's, you know, there's a clearer path for this, then some de decisions can be made at a more of a micro level. Things like HVAC units. We don't want to go install this stuff and then tear the building down, as an example. Not suggesting that that's what's going to happen, um, but I think everyone agrees it's too hot. So after the renovation of the high school, was there, do you have any like information on how much the operating and maintenance cost changed after the renovation? Like, was it 80% before and now it's 60% after? Ooh, like I don't have that number available to me, but we can, we can um, get that answer. I, um, I would think it is actually I it I'm sure it went up somewhat, but it has got to be more efficient mm -hmm. when you have insulation now and you have walls and you have correct windows and you, you know, all of those things. So there would, we did gain some efficiencies as well. It has not sacrificed how awesome the teachers are for the students here and the education. The teachers do amazing. I have two kiddos here, sixth grader, seventh grader. The education is top notch. So just to put your mind at ease. Well, my daughter's here in sixth grade right now. Yeah. So, but when you have a kid that comes home and tells you, my bathroom door doesn't lock, so I don't want to go to the bathroom at school. Right. The That's teachers may be teaching sense. phenomenally, mm -hmm. but when your kid doesn't want to come to school and she doesn't want to go to the bathroom, that puts a big er on her education. Sure. So as much as they can do, there needs to be little fixes sure. to make the rest of their time sure. and that, that, better. So yeah. I, I mean, I'm not questioning the education. Yeah. I'm just saying when she complains about going to the locker rooms and she's mad about gym and she doesn't want to do it, I can't say, well, they're working on it, but you'll be gone by the time it happens. But if I can say they're going to do a deep clean, they're going to fix all the locks, they have a plan to make it better for you, it would ease her mind knowing in September when she comes back, I want to be here, I want to be, I'm ready. 
Yeah. But if I say you have to wait five years and now you'll be at the awesome high school, it, it's not going to. Well, you can look at Yeah. You know, it's just the little things that I think yep. for a sixth right. grader. Absolutely. Right. That came from a nice elementary school, and then they come up here, and they're like, oh, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, no, I can't speak for the So it's just a little thing. We slowed that down. We, we thought about it. We have made a few little things. But we can maybe, maybe we can ratchet that up a little bit. Yeah, and, just, and I think it's the little kids, in the, it's the little things in their mind that make the biggest differences. Yep, absolutely. I was just wondering what the cost of the modules are, and it's 280. It's $280,000. Um, per, per module? Well, every module is different. So it depends on the quality that you do and what you did, but this current band modular is $280,000. Um, and we did a lease to own, correct? So we will own it at the end of paying off. Was it seven years? I think it was seven years that we, that we did the lease to own. So at the end of seven years, we will own it. And we, the SAU. Right, the SAU, that was a totally different one, right? So that was like Megan just said, that one was over a million dollars. But that's an entire school district office, classrooms. This this particular module is basically uh, an open shell with some practice rooms and a teacher space, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really just so it's big enough to accommodate the band. Uh, the superintendent can add to that. Good bathrooms. Oh, the bathrooms! <laughs> <laughs> she wants to be in the band. <laughs> They need that. Where exactly is the band portable going? It's right next to this portable. So is it going to be connected or just going to be a separate? Separate. Separate. No, the delay, the delay was because the demand for portables went through the roof from when we first started talking about it to when the bond was passed or whatever it was passed. So uh, that's why we put off. Like everybody wants one and we're one of many. And there are a few people providing it. John, great to have your expertise helping the town. I, and this may be to everyone. If I, if I remember correctly, somewhere I, I read that, uh, and I, I would think every person in Pelham, if this is true, would want to know this, that this building, our middle school, is only accredited as an elementary school. It's not accredited in the state. It's upper elementary. Upper elementary. Upper elementary, upper elementary, upper elementary, elementary school. Just and it, it doesn't, you know, so that, that kind of, I mean, I think we're doing a great job inside of getting, you know, the right teachers doing the right things. But I'm embarrassed that the tool we're giving them that we can't even make the state, you know, accreditation as as a middle school. Um, everybody in town ought to know that we've got to fix this problem, and we have to do some small stuff along the way. But in the long run, we really do have to do uh, some big stuff to, to to fix that. And that's uh, we are where we are. We can't change that. But, uh, uh, is a fundamental thing. It's extraordinary. Yeah. For clarification, but the reason that it is an upper elementary school is because we don't offer those shop type courses. So we don't because we don't offer those, we can only classify as an upper elementary school. So those are things like, you know, does this is there a will of this town to, to <coughs> then invest the money to to make this a true middle school, right? That's, that's a whole bigger ball of wax, a whole larger expense. Is it something that we feel is necessary? Or can we maybe still be an upper elementary school but then have facilities in things like a maker space or other areas or things that maybe give us a piece of that but may still not qualify us as an upper elementary school but take care of some of those, some of those needs that are, that are important. Um, you know, I can just generation. speak from my perspective. I, I, I think Amanda had talked about at the high school, and I was part of the building committee there, that it's not the high school of our dreams, it's the high school of our needs. Correct. And I would like to see that embraced by the town, that this may not be the, the, the middle school of our dreams, but I think it should be the middle school of our needs, and that would include all of the other educational spaces uh, for, for the, the whole you know, interest level, academic and social interest level of six, eight, and ninth graders, in my opinion. Just to kind of say, the makeup of the board right now is, I think, the right blend of people to make that happen. You know, um, There are individuals that have backgrounds, including myself, in the physical facility space. Um, we have educators who are engaged as well. Um, 
and really our charge is about the programmatic use of this building. Is it meeting the students' needs for education now? And if we don't do what we're doing, um, and I'm not saying this to sugarcoat it, Stacy and her staff, I, I walk through, I, I don't know how they do it. Um, I, my mom is also a teacher. She was a teacher for 36 years. I went and talked to her on the phone. I said, you got to come see this. <laughs> <laughs> she like, like a case study for first year uh, master's students or something. Um, so yeah, I think we're all cognizant of those things. We're working towards a unified goal on that front. Um, and I think transparency is one of the things that we brought up in our last meeting. We want to be as transparent in this as possible. We want the town to be engaged throughout. We want to have the discussions like these to say where we're at and get the feedback and the input, um, knowing that there's a need and we need to meet it. So, so real quick, a lot of people, somebody asked this question on our friend Facebook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why haven't you done anything? Like, why haven't you done anything? Well, it's, it's not for lack of trying, and I gave a brief answer to that, to, to that person on, on Facebook. So I'm gonna to try to do this really quick. So this town had exponential growth in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, like 50% population growth booms, like it was crazy. So we had the Sherpin School over there, the kids were falling out of the windows, it was so overcrowded. <laughs> so it was, just, it was just crazy. So they built, the, uh, they built this school in 64, 65. I mean, it was a real dire situation over there. It was so crowded, right? So they built this, and like John mentioned, literally two years later, what, they had 12 classrooms or 16 classrooms? Literally two years later. That is how quickly things jump. So when that happens, what happens? Your taxes go through the roof, right? So now everybody's like, I don't, want, I don't want my taxes to go up. I don't want my taxes to go up. So then everything, things start to get not voted in. It took forever to get the elementary school built, right? So we finally get that built. Meanwhile, we, we build the high school in 74, which was a gift. It turned out maybe not the best thing, but at the time, those voters and those people in charge did the best thing that they could do with what they had, knowing they just built a, a middle school. Taxes are going through the roof. They had $2 million, $2 million to build that high school. But they did it, okay? Fast forward, hindsight, oh my goodness, open concept's terrible, this school's not working, we need to fix it, right? So, but meanwhile, this school is now busting out of the seams. We build the elementary school. Now everybody still is still reeling from some of these, all this growth. We built a municipal center, we built a library, we needed a fire station. All these things play into this stuff. It's not like everybody's like, yeah, we're not gonna do that, right? People wanted to do stuff. And there's some of these things people took years and years and years to get passed, and then they finally passed. So this is where, this is how we kind of got to where we are now, all right? We looked at the needs and we realized the high school was of bigger importance than here because we were on warning for accreditation facility because of the facility. So that became a more pressing need than here. So that's kind of quick, quick, quick synopsis of how we got to where we are. It took three or four tries to get the high school renovated. There was the, this is before I came, but there was the proposal to do a, a co-op with Wyndham that failed. And I believe there were one or two other uh, attempts as well before we finally got in 2013. In 2010, we had the new and new one which missed by 65 votes. Okay, they're about 1.5%, they're about, it was, it was short. Um, part of the strategy is not to do sticker shock on the tax bill. If we, we have a lot of needs, we have a lot of urgent needs, but if we put everything on a, on a bill, on a Warren article, or on multiple Warren calls in the same election year, we don't believe they'll pass. Many of them have failed. By trying to tie this into, into timing, for example, next year there's a CBA, the, the teacher's contract. The following year there would be PESBA contract, which is the uh, IA contract, but possibly also the PMS uh, facilities plan. You have to time these things out so it doesn't do sticker shock because as much as the students and the, sta and the parents, the, the school district community want and recognize these needs, we have to convince the community at large to do this. So we have to always be aware that if we ask for too much at one time, we probably will not get it. But one of the things we've learned, and I, I know from my own experience, I've been on the board for five years now. Since in the last five years, we have passed every Warren article except for one. 
and that was an esoteric, you know, holdover surpluses to the following year. But every contract, every warrant article is, has passed on that. In part, we're asking for what we need. We're also being prepared with what we need. We can explain to you why we're asking for these things. You may agree with it, you may vote for it, you may not agree with it, but our purpose is to make sure that you're educated about it, that you understand where we come from, what the concerns are, and what, hopefully, the rewards you're gonna benefit. Because if you don't do anything, as, as he said, as Joe said before, is it's gonna cost more later. It already is costing more. Okay, that's the reality of it. The things we haven't done in the past is costing more today. But we can't dwell on it. We have to say, if we don't do things today, it will cost even more later. And in the meantime, it's hurting, especially in the school district, it's hurting our students. Okay, we have to work toward that. Any other questions on this subject? Yeah. Do we have the ability, like I know driving by that Wyndham is doing construction right now, and all that, do we have the ability to reach out to them and kind of get lessons learned from them? So, I mean, I know you've applied, you're already applying lessons learned from the high school renovation. I didn't know if it was worth reaching out to them. I suppose you could. We do have, um, you know, we do have um, Mr. Holy and, and Mr. Gould who are on the, and they're both facilities guys on this committee. We have lessons learned. We used owner project management um, that have extensive background in uh, uh, owners, owner project management uh, managers that have extensive school building background. So we've learned a lot from that. Um, I, hope, it, I suppose it doesn't hurt. I don't know if they if they've done it right or they've done it wrong. You know, um, but it, I suppose it doesn't hurt. But because we have that owner project manager in the past, we, I'm not sure who, how that's going to work going forward. But in order to build the high school, they brought in a wealth of knowledge of, of school buildings for us. I think it's important to remember also, Wyndham High School was built because Wyndham were sending their kids to Salem, and Salem said, we can't do it anymore. They didn't have an option. I believe the same thing with the high school in 74. It was, correct. I believe that we were tuitioning out, and in 74, we had, the school board at the time had to make a very fast decision and come up with a very fast solution. We were, we, were, we were tuitioning out to Hudson, and if there's a, an older timer here that has a better history than me, but well, I'm pretty sure what happened is, unfortunately, Hudson School caught on fire and burned down. So it was, there it was, was a couple there, years later. Huh? It was later. I believe Albert was just about this before the high school was built. I could be wrong, but, and I know you're an old timer, but. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but I love Jim. I love Jim. Oh. P so, P but, uh, PHS class of 78. He is, he's the first graduating class from Pelham High School. Woo! Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this year, so if you want to go. Next, for, next Friday. <laughs> so part of the thing is, in those circumstances, the need is obvious to the community. No high school for a Wyndham, they have to build a high school. It's harder for us to show that need. This is part of that project, is to try to show the need that we do have to address this, this thing. We're five years into the into the addition, I think, when we first started it. This, this, it was passed in 14. And okay, passed in 13. 13. No, uh, 14. 14. 14. Passed in 14. So we're four years into it. Hopefully, remember, it took four times, three or four times to do that. So we're we're being we're we're going for that, and we're trying to do it. We're trying to go all in. So we do have to get all this information in place. We feel that the more information you have, the better it is. Can I just take? Her first, and then yourself. Have you considered tapping into the parents that are currently at Pelham Elementary School, whose kids will benefit when you do the renovations here? I think yes. a lot of them don't understand what it looks like here and what things are like here. Absolutely. So, you know, and I don't know if a lot of people remember, but when we built that high school, we did a number of different things. We did tours. We actually had community night over at the high school so people could go see it. We did a number of different things. We stood, we sat, I don't know how many times we set up our little table and sat at different events to explain things to people and, and do that. That whole engagement process will absolutely continue, and obviously the elementary school kids is, is a huge resource. So one of the things I remember about the, uh, when we voted for the high school addition was that the high school was about to lose its accreditation, right? For facilities, yes. For facilities, and this is not quite at that state, is that right? 
like, because that was one of the reasons to get people out to vote was that our high school facility was going to lose its accreditation, and who mm -hmm. wanted to live in a town without a high school? So that's why lots of people came out, I think, for that. We're not quite at that stage here, but we can get there. You don't have accreditation for those Right. But you know what I think we can capture, and I'm sneaking on you, Gail, inside, sorry. So, <laughs> what I think we can capture here is what we learned about educational programming and how that benefits our students by building that school. That is what we can capture here. We are lacking sorely in a lot of areas for educational programming. So I think people are starting to get it, right? We don't need a, such a hot button topic, I'm hoping, <laughs> to drive people to the polls that they, they're getting it. You, like we said, all those Warren articles have passed in the last five years because we're starting to get it. We're starting to realize what we need to do. And um, I'm, we're gonna just keep pushing that home with the educational program, the educational program. I mean, look at these tables, right? This is not how kids sit now. They wanna sit in groups and they wanna, classrooms, classrooms, I don't know, I, I can't, I, I'll speak for me. I, some of you guys are too young for this, but um, you know, classrooms are in rows. Like this, you know, if you go into a classroom now, we're starting to turn over the furniture so now that they're tables, so it's collaboration. So all those things that um, play into better educational programming, I'm hoping is gonna drive it. All right, I interrupt you guys. Sorry. The facilities committee is part, of the pro is part of the puzzle. There are many other things. If you remember for the high school one, we also had many other initiatives, information sessions and all the things. Mr. Vincent was part of the great conversation a parent going out, trying to talk to small groups of, of, of interested individuals in the, the proposals that were coming in place and some of the concerns we had. It was a holistic approach. It was not just the board, it was not just the district, it was, a, it was the whole community. That's necessary as well. But part of that is also making sure that we have the details and the data to be able to support it. When we can explain it, we have a better chance of, of having success. But we have to be able to get it out there, and it's true. We don't have many methods to get out there. We have, yeah, there's Facebook, there's Twitter. If you don't feel like reading it, you don't actually see it. I don't know how many people have gone to the website to get information on that. There is a lot of information there. There's a lot of updates. It's not always used as much as it could be, but we don't have a mechanism where we can say, you have to read this. You should be aware of this. It requires an active participation on the other side. But it is part of the thing. <laughs> yep. Everybody leave here and tell everybody and talk about it to everybody. It's amazing how that, that can really help. Before social media and, and engagement, you know, some of the campaigns were uh, email campaigns. And it, and it was just like, share, like, chair, 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 chair. And then things I shared actually came back to me from some people. And so, there, I mean, we can use every avenue. We changed the voter's guide. We, the voter's guide used to just be part, used to go out with, with the town only. Then we decided, you know, we need our own voters' guide so that school issues are um, seen separately. More, we put pictures in, we put data in, so that it is more informative to people. The Pelham Message Board was part of a big, big part of our program as well, yes. and also Pelham Wyndham News. It did uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. wasn't great, but it, it, you know, people did read it and they did get informed. We don't have those same mechanisms here now. I was just trying to remember collectively that I've been in town since 2001, but the high school that passed, I'll get the numbers a little wrong, but I remember something by like 50 votes and like 75 high school students had turned 18 and voted. There was something. I think it was a little higher. Was, I think it was a little over 100 high school students actually turned 18, registered to vote that day. We had a, the, one of the higher voter registrations that day, and most of it was the high school kids that came out and voted and, and brought that, now, so brought it to, no, brought it home. No, no, how they voted, yeah. but the, the point is it was close, yeah. right? Yeah. And imagine the conversation we'd be having tonight if that hadn't gone that way you know, in 2014. So I mean, it's, it, it, and, and that was with a lot of communication up front, but we need to do even better because we, we need to get this done in one shot, not four. Can we get middle schoolers? Middle schoolers. We're going to lower the voting age. Well, I, I think the key is going to the elementary school. Yeah. Because they're the ones that are going to benefit from that. Yeah. And it's, you know, we all, uh, we could go into these big long discussions about voter turnout and all that. So about over 13,000 people in this town, about 9,000 registered voters, 
Um, the last election was a little snowy, so we can't count that. The election before that, 1,700 people. 1,700. That's it, of 9,000 plus registered voters. So that's who's making the decisions in the town. So that's why engagement, getting people out and, and, and showing up to vote. Anything else before we... I really thank you guys for coming. Like, I'm really psyched. Like, I, I walked in the pulled in the drive, and I'm like, oh, there's people here. <laughs> that was really awesome. It's awful. not like a board meeting. Yeah. yeah, so come to the board meetings. Otherwise, we have to stare at chairs. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, we really appreciate you coming. Are there any other questions on any topics? You've got the opportunity now. We've got 10 minutes. <laughs> yes. Right over here and then over there. So I know we have to work towards the new agreement for 2019. What, what kind of progress has been made for next year to fill in the 26% gap? We've never had to do that. We've never had to ask the teachers to add on. We've always been able to fully staff. So that is obviously the hope now that is going on currently. We're working diligently at it. <laughs> We've had some difficult staff issues. We have people leave after school start. So we have had some difficulties. We have got to be hired. And our intention is to fill up and hopefully get into it. There was a question there first. And then we've actually dropped down to about 1960. And I think they're they're, they're kind of steady or creeping a little bit. That it's not any exponentially huge jump. There was a service that did that, and they no longer do it except for under a significant cost. Um, just, the just enrollment, projection. enrollment projections. Uh, the problem with that, though, is it doesn't, it, it takes into account the, like the stratospheric things how many families are moving into the into into the district how what are the kids already at for example it got totally skewed when we did the renovation addition it's not built to handle that because it looks at trends and you know birth rates and, and uh, new houses and all that it doesn't take into account when something actually gets changed in the district um, so we haven't been doing that but we did go down after 2008 after the recession we went down significantly We've actually leveled out, whereas many of the districts in, in New Hampshire are still dropping. We're at about just under 2,000 altogether. We've been fairly stable in that range, but I do know that we have, for example, incoming uh, kindergartners. You know, last, currently we have 72, and now we have 90 applications for next year. You do lose some because they don't always want to do the half-day kindergarten, but the numbers are starting to creep up again in, in those areas. But projections, we, we don't do that anymore. There was a question over there. First thing is we have a senior center and anybody in the community can go to the senior center and get to know some of the seniors. I am not old enough to be at the senior center. <laughs> Actually I am, but I'm not. Right? And I, I think I'm older than anybody in here, but I have a 16 year old boy at the high school, so I'm a high mileage parent. My, my, my point about senior adults is we are as much a part of the community as anybody. I spend my volunteer time with Boy Scouts. So I'm in the community. I do things with other people. There are people like me that show up at Little League. So the way that we educate is we make sure that we know our neighbors. Um, and this is, I think, I'm going to digress momentarily. I moved here almost 25 years ago, and I moved here by choice. I looked at 
San Francisco. I looked at the bluegrass in Kentucky. I looked at North Carolina around Asheville. I picked, literally, I picked Pelham, New Hampshire right here. I like it. And I love where I live, and I like what I see. We Are we perfect? No. But we are a great community, and there are more resources in Pelham to help us to be the best kind of community ever, and it really relies on the elementary school parents and the middle school, pardon me, the upper, middle, upper elementary school parents and the high school parents and the I ain't got no kid people all getting to know each other through all the different venues that we have. We have the library, we have the actors thing, we have park and recs, we have the town meetings, we have, we have the grocery store, we have, you just go on and on. And it, the key is to get to know your neighbors. So I have new neighbors on one side. I literally drove my truck out of my driveway and parked in front of his house. That sounds kind of crazy, right? But I figured it would be a little bit less scary if I pulled my truck up and then said, hi, what you doing? And uh, introduced myself and got to know them. Uh, they have a seven-year-old girl. They have a dog named Jack, and they're cool people. And they now know I'm the crazy old man that lives next door. So that's how you do it. That, I think, and, and then I have a neighbor at the end of the street, all the way down, that plows my driveway. And uh, he didn't know I was involved with the school district. And I said, so what do you think about the new high school? He said, it's going to make our taxes go up. And I said, I'll tell you what's going to make our taxes go up is when we don't have an accredited high school. I educated him. So really and truly, it's just you, those of us who are invested in this community need to step up and educate our neighbors and our friends and our families, and we have to, and we invite them to be part of meetings like this. I was just going to add quickly that part of that great conversation was having conversations at the Senior Center, at, at Dunkin' Donuts, at the BFW, at the Congregational Church, at the library. I mean, it was all part, so hopefully everyone here can also tell other people to be part of that and something like that uh, can and should happen officially as well as the unofficial. Yeah, unofficially the oligarchy meets at McDonald's. <laughs> Actually, demographically, I believe 35 to 44 is our highest demographic as far as population is concerned. So, and, and, and which I think sometimes surprises people. But, um, and um, I don't know, I, the seniors that I talk to are always, have yeah, been pretty cool. And pretty supportive. I don't think that I think it's a little bit of a a little bit of a misnomer that that they're the ones that vote no. Um, but um, hey, Dave's idea of talking to people and stuff is is definitely the way to go. So. When we did the superintendent search for the next year, uh, we hired um, New Hampshire School Board Association to help us do that process. When we wanted to reach out to community to try to get their input on what they believe would be an ideal candidate for a superintendent, we also went to the senior center as well. We feel that we have to approach every constituency, okay? It affects them. It, taxes affect them, so they have to understand what it is we're asking for and why we're asking for it. So we do, but we, it is a community effort as well. We do need that, we do need that support. There's only so much we can do as a board. There's only so much we can do as a, in a district level. It does require a lot of activism. I brought cookies to the senior center when I wanted to get elected. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. We're, we're talking about 41 teachers are leaving, and are they going to be filled positions, or will they be asked to take on more? And I know you said they're trying to fill the positions, but just even, I have a son in middle school, he's in seventh grade. When he was in first grade, kids in his class, now I'm seeing higher numbers, 23, maybe 24. So. When you're saying you're filling all the positions and teachers aren't being asked to take on more, but the classes are growing. It, it's not the result of not being able to fill positions. And you guys might want to help me out here because I, I don't want to mess this up. But um, um, because we haven't ever not been able to fill a position, yeah. and we're still within contractual limits as far as um, students per grade. I think there's a lot of different decisions that get made in as far as trade-offs and things. If a teacher were to leave, maybe we hired a specialist instead and maybe bumped it up to two or three kids a classroom in order to get a specialist hired for this. Or, do you know what I mean? So there, were, there may have been trade-offs in, the, in, in why that has happened. I don't know if anybody can add anything to that. We don't dictate that. That comes from administration level. They make decisions based on what the, what's available, what the resources are. As far as I know, all the positions that we know are available that are open for next year are posted and 
interviews are taking place for those applicants. How it shakes out by the end of, by and the end of August, I, I don't know. I, we haven't been there have been shortfalls at times, but they we are aware that there are shortfalls and we try to do what we can to make sure that we can fill those those positions. There are no plans in the budget to reduce those positions. That's our that's from our perspective. The budget we passed is a budget we believe we need for next year. So the money is there. The conditions under which we can offer employment, the positions that we have on available, the needs that we have, those are determined at, at different areas. But the budget has been passed based on, the, on what we need. So we do have to find what we need, and we do have to look around and make sure that we fill all those positions. Is there any plan not to? No, there isn't. There was somebody. <laughs> Yeah, we, there was what was, it was compensation, retirement, and job relocation, and family. Were the three? Yeah. Yes. We will be. Uh, I don't believe it's posted yet, but we will, well, actually it isn't because we just finished it a lot a while ago. We will post the presentation. Both I think the PMS presentation I believe is already posted on the website. I don't know if it's on a special specific location. I don't recall, but I, it's there. I don't know where it is. It's there. We'll see if we can get a little pointer on that, uh, maybe on the front page. But otherwise, we're, we'll make sure that we also post a presentation we did on teacher retention and recruitment. Are there any other, you know, we're coming up on 8 o'clock. Is there any last questions or last concerns or last remarks, either from anybody on the board, I don't think, or anybody in the audience? I see one there. No, not you, him. I was telling him to hold a second. Go ahead. Yes. Or dad. Absolutely. Always a cheerleader for that. <laughs> All right. You guys want to go home? Oh, you got last thing. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for coming here. Uh, it was, we're very pleased to see the turnout, and I think it's going to mean we're going to have another. Thank you very much.